Hi class, and welcome to another edition of the Home Gardening Course. Now, we have a guest speaker talking to you today about botany and what every gardener should know. I think you're really going to enjoy this. Uh, botany can be a tedious, detailed uh, discipline, uh, very technical, but we have someone here who's going to make it a lot of fun for you. Uh, if you watch the um, previous videos, you've seen our speaker in the soil testing lab, and so I'd like to introduce her. This is Dr. Paula Barton Willis. She's a, got her doctorate in plant pathology. She's a horticulturalist, and she's been teaching botany and biology for uh, quite a few years, so I think you're really going to enjoy her. Thank you, Dr. Joe. Botany, it is a science, more of a pure science, and it talks all about plants, uh, the parts of plants, classification of plants, uh, just anything you want to know other than how to grow them and grow food to eat. So that's where we're going to connect the two today and introduce you into, again, like Joe said, the botany that every gardener should know. Botany is the biology of plants, where horticulture is how to grow them. It's the art and practice of garden cultivation and management. A lot of people throw around scientific names, okay? Scientific name is something that we've all agreed upon as people who study plants to name a plant so that when I talk to somebody in Colorado from Louisiana, we know what we're talking about. We're talking about the same plant when we use a scientific name. When you use a common name, it can often be confusing, especially for different parts of the country. Here is an example of a, a scientific name. It's the scientific name for the cypress tree, Taxodium disticum. It's always a two-name name, started by this guy over here, uh, Carolus Linnaeus. Uh, and there's a specific way to write them, but you won't really need to be involved with this uh, in your gardening. But if you do see a scientific name, that's why some people use them. Here's an example of what can happen. This is a scientific name versus common name, okay? Here's a common name, three different common names used in three different parts of the country. Fishing worm tree, Catawba tree, and Indian cigar tree. The common name, I mean, excuse me, the scientific name is Catalpa bignonioides. And here is the plant, and you can see why some people would call it the fish worm tree. Here's a nice big fat army worm that people would collect and use for fishing. Here's the long uh, cylindrical fruits that people might call an Indian cigar, and then it has beautiful flowers as well. So three different common names, but if we all use this name when we really need to, we know we're talking about the same plant. Okay, we're talking about the group today of angiosperms. Almost all edible, all the plants we grow for food are angiosperms, which means they are flowering plants. Not all groups of plants have flowers. For example, pine trees and ferns, you never see a flower on those. Uh, but practically all of the common vegetable crops and even our agronomic crops like rice and wheat are angiosperms and they, they do flower. Even though the flowers may not be obvious, they are there. Here are some examples, not vegetables, but here are some beautiful examples of flowering angiosperms. Okay, angiosperms are divided into two groups the monocots and the eudicots. There is a third group that's recently been separated out, but we will not deal with them at all. The two groups of angiosperms we're going to talk about are monocots and dicots, and here is a table showing each. Here are the monocots and all of the things that they have in common, and here are the dicots and all the things that they have in common. Now, the official name for dicots is called eudicots, but with any older literature that you're going to find still calls them dicots, so that's what we're going to do. Now, the monocots uh, have one seed leaf, therefore the mono part. That's the number of seed leaves. Inside here is an example of corn. Their veins run more parallel, and you can see we'll contrast these in a minute. Uh, their vascular tissue, or their transport tissue, up and down the stems, roots, and leaves, uh, is just kind of scattered around in these little bundles. Their roots are called fibrous. There's no one main root. They're all kind of just coming out kind of equally uh, large. And then their flower parts are always in three. See, this has one, two, three, four, five, six petals. Okay, so they're in threes or groups of threes, multiples of three. Whereas the dicots, on the other hand, have two seed leaves, two seed leaves. Their veins are netted. You see, those are not all running in the same direction. 
Their vascular tissue appears in rings, in the stem especially. They have what's called a taproot, one main root that other roots come off of. And then the floral parts are not in threes, they're in multiples of four or five. Okay, now you know, the <laughs> is this a monocot or a dicot? Well, let's look at it. How many petals are there? One, two, three, four, five. So that would make it a dicot. Here is one with a tap root. That would make it a dicot. Here's one with a fibrous. There's no main root here. There are all these little tiny roots coming out about equal size. So this would make it a monocot. Grouping plants by life history. There are three groupings here. There are annuals who live, that live for one year and go from seed to seed. There are biennials that live for two years and go from seed to seed. And then perennials that come back year after year in our gardens. Okay, so annuals <coughs> that fit this category are vegetables, peas, corn, okra, and watermelon. You have to replant them every spring because no part of the plant will survive other than seed, which uh, uh, they would come back from that. Grouping plants by life history, the second group is biennials. Now these are seed to seed in two years. The first year what will happen is you get a rosette, like a little clump of, of foliage, and then the second year it will send up a flower stalk. So the first year seeds germinate and leaves are produced, the second year plant fl it flowers, and then at the end of that year it dies. Examples here for vegetables would be beets, kale, hollyhocks, and foxglove for flowers. Okay, here's an example of what the first year would look like, uh, and then the flower stalk would come up from that the second year. The third group are perennials, and these uh, persist or, or will stay in your garden for, for many years and keep coming back that you can enjoy. They do not die after flowering or setting seed. Some examples of vegetables would be Things that we actually sometimes grow as annuals, but tomatoes and peppers are actually perennials uh, where they are native. Now we're going to kind of get a little more technical in the basic plant structures. They're, the plants, but the parts of a plant are important to know because it will help you uh, in communicating with say your agents, if you need help, what part of your plant is it that you need help with or that you see symptoms on. It will help you to understand labels when you read them for pesticides uh, and, and other things, other uh, journal articles that you may be looking at to find information. So they're grouped, the, the parts of plants are grouped into two. There are the vegetative structures, which have nothing to do with sexual reproduction. Those are the roots, stems, and leaves. And then the reproductive structures, which have everything to do with uh, sexual reproduction. These are the flowers, the fruits, and the seeds. So we'll start at the bottom with the roots. What are roots for? Well, first of all, they anchor the plant in the ground. Then they absorb minerals and nutrients from the soil and bring it up through the plant. Now you know when you put fertilizer on, you generally put it on the roots, and that's why, because they take, as those fertilizers and those nutrients are dissolved in water, they're taken up uh, by the roots. And also, they can be modified for storage. Here is a picture of a good set of roots anchoring <laughs> this turf in the ground. Okay, for absorbing, and they absorb water, dissolve minerals. I don't know if you remember from soils, we talked about the soil ions that are exchanged on the soil particle and taken up by the roots. Here's a picture of the little root hairs that actually do all the work of absorbing. And here's a nice uh, pea root. Here's just kind of a, a, a diagram of the same thing with a root hair uh, and some soil particles. The next is the stem, okay? And this is a stem that has several different uh, functions, One, the mostly to hold the leaves up for photosynthesis. But another hugely important function is to bring the water and absorb nutrients from the roots up to the leaves where they're needed. This is called the vascular tissue. It's kind of a bunch of cells that are arranged like pipes that can carry uh, water and dissolve nutrients up the plant. So we're absorbing down here and then being transferred up to where those are needed uh, by the rest of the plant. Uh, some roots are set aside for storage. 
in fleshy tap roots. Here are sweet potatoes, and these parts of the roots have been set aside for storing starches and sugars that are produced when there's lots of sunshine and water, and then they may be used again by the plant on a rainy day whenever there isn't photosynthesis to be brought up to the plant and used. Here's a carrot, an absolutely uh, huge storage root, and here are daikon that have some, uh, somewhat very, something very similar. A healthy root system and good soil is the foundation of a healthy plant. Okay, you need to know what water conditions your roots like. Some roots like it wetter, some roots like it drier. You need to know what plant you're, where you're planting and how the, what those roots need. Uh, roots that we eat include carrots, beets, sweet potatoes, radishes, jicama, and parsnips. I'll show you some edible plant parts uh, near the end. Okay, we had two different kinds of root systems the tap root system and the fibrous root system. Now you remember with monocots and dicots, that was one of the differences between them. The tap root was for the dicots and the fibrous root system was for the monocots. Here is a bean germinating and you see here's the one main root coming out and then the other roots will come uh, from that main root as they develop. This is still the tap root even though there are many other roots. You may think it's a fibrous system at first glance but you see there's one main root that everything comes from. Here in corn, which is a monocot, has the fibrous root system, and many roots arise all kind of at the same time, so there's not one main lead tap root. This is something that over the last 20 years we've really uh, come to understand that uh, there's something called mycorrhizae, which are fungi in the soil that actually have an, uh, kind of a symbiotic relationship where they both benefit that the fungus will actually attach to the roots and the fungus can grow out much further than the root system of the plant. So this attachment is, is beneficial to both because the plant gets an extended root system to absorb water and minerals. The fungus will do all of that and transfer it into the plant and the fungus gets sugars from the plant without even damaging it. So there is some leakage of sugars and things into the soil from the roots and the fungus takes advantage of that. And that association, that fungus that makes that association is called mycorrhizae. Stems. From the main above ground, it's the main above ground support system, okay, of the plant. It may function in storage or photosynthesis, and it transports water and dissolved minerals. We saw as the roots bring up the uh, water and dissolved minerals, uh, it has to go through the stem. Okay, this is this, those tissues that do that are called the vascular system. The part that brings water and dissolved minerals up from, up from the ground is called xylem. Transport of food from the leaves. Okay, so the root, the, the water, and the dissolved minerals come into the plant from the roots. They travel up through the stem, they get to the leaves. Well, what's happening in the leaves? Photosynthesis. Sugars are being made. So does the root down at the bottom of the plant need sugars? Yes. Can it make sugars? No, because there's no light. So the, the leaves send sugars down to the roots so they can uh, use those for energy and, the parts of, and building the parts that they need. This part of the vascular system is called phloem. So xylem goes up and phloem comes down. Water and minerals up in the xylem, sugars and water come down in the phloem. Okay, stem anatomy. Stems, you think, well, a stem is pretty simple. But I'm hoping that you can see this well. But here is a plant stem. And if you notice here, there are points on this stem where we're pretty regularly spaced spots on this stem where leaves come out. Those are called nodes. The paces in between where the stems come out are called internodes. So where leaves come out, it's called a node. This is a node, here's a node, a node on the stem. Wherever a leaf, there, the, the stems also have apical buds, and I, you, I know you can't see this, you just have to believe me, that at every point of attachment of a leaf, there is a little tiny bud there which could have the ability to open and start to grow and grow a new stem or a flower or it depends on what plant you have, but it has the ability to grow something there. It's called a meristem. Here's a, an example a picture 
of showing a, a tomato plant, okay? And here's a node, here's a node, here's a node, here's a node, and all the spaces in between I'll call internodes. Now if you notice there's a little spot here where a plant, uh, in this case, it, the bud broke and uh, started to grow and produced fruit. Here is where the fruit started as flat in a part of the flower, and these are uh, buds that have not begun to grow yet, but these are the axillary buds, which we'll talk about in a minute. Okay, there are woody stems and there are herbaceous stems. Woody stems have xylem, that transport tissue that is hardened over the years, wood like in a tree, okay? The other kind are herbaceous stems, and these are soft and fleshy and usually annuals and biennials, any kind of herbs that you know have herbaceous stems. Now some stems like okra stems, over the, by the end of the year they seem kind of hard, but that's not really wood, it, and it will die back in the winter. There are modified stems. Now, if you notice any plant part we talk about, there's gonna be modifications. We are talking about the most common types here. All of these plant parts are modified in different plants around the world. In this case, the Irish potato is actually a stem. It's part of the stem underground that's modified for storage. So sweet potatoes are roots. Irish potatoes or white potatoes are called, or they're part of the plant called the stem. Okay, ginger plants grow from underground stems called rhizomes, as, as well as ferns do that same thing. And other modified stems are crowns, spurs, stolons, corns. And if you order plants from a catalog, sometimes you'll be getting these structures to start your plants from. Stems as food, how many can you name? Look at, the, look at it for a minute and see if you can name any of these. Well, this is ginger, it's one of those underground stems. This is white or Irish potatoes. We got Opuntia cactus stems, and this is a rutabaga, which looks like a root, but it's actually a part of the stem. The roots would come out down here. And these are all edible parts that are stems. Asparagus, that's all it, pretty much, that's all it is, is a stem <laughs> that you eat. And of course, sugar cane. We don't eat the actual canes, but we sure enjoy uh, what's made from the juice. Okay, let's talk about buds a little bit on the stem. Here is a picture of a stem with uh, the buds labeled. There's usually a bud, at, when this plant starts to grow, there's a bud at the top. This is the terminal or the end bud. And then here are these lateral buds that we're talking about. Okay, one of the lateral buds is the axillary bud. Here is a, a showing where the buds are in relationship to the leaves. So we have node, node, and node. Then we have internodes. And right where the stem intersects the leaf is this bud that we were talking about before. There's one here and here, it's called the axillary bud. Now we're gonna talk about that in a minute in relation to recognizing a, a particular kind of leaf. But these buds are named by location. Which one of these are buds? Look at it for a minute. Well, broccoli is flower buds. These are uh, little buds that are actually axillary buds. Broccoli is flower buds. And I think that's pretty much it. Okay, what is the function of leaves? Okay, leaves are the main photosynthetic tissue in plants. That's where it happens, okay? The main function of leaves is a manufacture of food from water and carbon dioxide. They take these raw materials, water from the roots, carbon dioxide from the air, in the presence of sunlight or some kind of suitable artificial light, and to use as an energy source, and they do photosynthesis, okay? They can make everything they need from raw materials. They have the sugars, which have a carbon backbone, and the, the carbon backbone with those nutrients they bring up from the roots, they can make anything they need, such as DNA, they can make their own proteins, they can make a lot of different uh, foods that we have to eat. We can't make them. All the carbon, now this is one of my favorite things about photosynthesis, uh, all the carbon, <laughs> and everything on Earth that is or ever was alive came into it through photosynthesis of plants. All the energy in every living thing, living now or ever was alive, came into it from plants changing light energy into chemical energy and sugars. So photosynthesis is a very, very important chemical reaction. I'm not gonna teach you the chemistry of it though. 
Okay, functions of leaves continued. Gas exchange. Plants have little holes, in the, usually in the bottom of their leaves, called stomates. Plants need carbon to do photosynthesis. They take it in as carbon dioxide, and then once they finish with photosynthesis, they produce as a byproduct oxygen. So they open these little holes to exchange gases with the atmosphere, just like you do with your mouth and your nose. We exchange gases, we take in oxygen and, and release carbon dioxide, the opposite of plants, but it's the same purpose. But as they do this, they leave, if they leave their stomates open to exchange gases, they also lose moisture. Again, just like you would do from your mouth if you left it open too long. This is called transpiration, and it's actually part, it's a bit, it, if you think about all the plants in all the world doing transpiration, losing uh, water vapor, it actually is a part of the water cycle. Okay, let's look at some external anatomy of leaves. There's a blade or lamina, the big flat part of a leaf. There's a petiole, the little stem that holds it on. And some leaves are just stuck right onto the stem. They don't have one, they're called sessile. And then there is the midrib or vein of the leaf. Here is a picture showing all of that, okay? Main function, photosynthesis, making sugars, and then here's the anatomy. Here is the blade, the main part of the leaf. And again, this is just a simple leaf. There's all kinds of variations going on in, in other plants, okay? And here is the petiole, the part that holds it to the stem. In here would be an axillary bud, an axillary bud where that one's attached as well. The place on the stem where these are attached is called a node. And then the vein, the main vein running right down the middle of the, of the leaf is called the midrib. This is part of that vascular system that we talked about that brings up the water from the roots, runs it through the stem, and then up to the leaves. This is just for fun, you won't have to know any of this, but just to show you, this is if you, if you opened up the leaf and looked inside. It's got all these cells that are green to do photosynthesis, and here's one of those veins that's bringing water up uh, from the roots, and then part of it is uh, bringing water up from the roots, the other half is sending sugars down to the roots. Leaf arrangement. There's three ways that the leaves are arranged on the, um, on the stem alternate for each other, opposite to each other, and whorled. And I think the best way to describe that is to, as I tell you, is to show you. Okay, <clears throat> here is the stem I was showing you earlier, and this is alternate arrangement. There's one leaf per node, okay? There's one, one leaf at every node, and that's called alternate. There's a situation where they are opposite each other, two per node, and that's called opposite arrangement. Okay, this is only, two, only one because I ripped it off, but there are two at every node, so that is opposite. They are opposite each other. And the third is when there's more than two per node. This is lemon verbena, it smells so good. There are three leaves, I don't know if you can see that, three leaves at every node. So this is called whorled. Whorled with a W-H, whorled. So here's our alternate, one per node, opposite. There are two per node, opposite each other. And then whorled, in this case, I only had three. In this case, there are one, two, there are six per node. Okay, leaf veins. Again, that's the vascular system in the leaves. There are parallel veins that run all the same direction, as you remember in monocots. And then there's netted or reticulate veins that branch off from a main vein, and that's what we see in dicots. Here, I don't know if you can get a view of this, but corn has a beautiful set of parallel veins. Okay, corn, again, is a monocot, and just to prove it to you, here is its nice fibrous root system to go with that. It is a monocot. But if we look at the ve veination in it, it's all parallel. They're all running in the same direction. In a dicot, they branch from a main, from a main vein. Okay, here in this squash leaf is an example of netted. Now this has the main vein here, and here's a big veins running this way, and then everything's branching off from those. So this is netted or reticulate venation. And these are all important in helping to classify plants and know what plants you've got. 
Okay, there are two types of netted venation. If you're parallel veined, you're parallel veined. But if you're netted, it could be in two different arrangements. It could be pinnately arranged veins, and those are come off like the pinna of a feather. And that would be like this. There's one veined vein, and then the other veins are coming off of it like the pinna of a feather. Or it could be palmate, like this one, where the main veins come off from a central location down here, like the, uh, or the palm of your hand is the origin of your fingers as they come out in different directions. Two types of netted venation, again, pinnate venation, main, one main vein with veins coming out from that. Palmate venation is central location with main veins coming out in different directions. There are, are simple and compound leaves. The leaf that we looked at as an example of the leaf where you saw the lamina and the blade, that is a simple leaf. This is a simple leaf. This, on the other hand, is a compound leaf. A simple leaf has one blade per flower. A compound leaf where the blade is made into many leaflets. Well, how do I know if this whole thing is a leaf or if each one of these is a leaf? How do I know if it's, a called, if it's a compound leaf? Well, you look for the axillary bud. Okay, this angle between the stem and the petiole is called the axle. And if it's a true leaf, in between the petiole and the stem, there will be a little tiny axillary bud. If you look at where the leaflets meet, there will never be an axillary bud. So I know then from this that this whole thing, because there's an axillary bud here, this whole thing is a leaf, and each one of these is not a leaf. It's a leaflet, part of a compound leaf. Okay, now if you look at compound leaves, again, they have a blade divided into separate uh, leaflets, and I told you uh, how to show the difference, but there's, <clears throat> here is a picture showing the same thing. Here's your simple leaf, one blade, here's your axillary bud, so we know that that's a whole leaf. Same thing here. Is each one of these a leaf? Or is this whole thing a leaf? Well, you look for the axillary bud, and that tells you that everything after the axillary bud is all one leaf. There are two different kinds of compound leaves. This is palmately compound, again, because the leaflets come off from one central location in different directions. And there is pinnately compound, such as this, where the leaflets, the leaf, this is all one leaf, the axillary bud would be there, this is all one leaf, and the, the, the leaflets come off like the pinna of a feather. Again, here are the pictures of, whoa, <laughs> a simple leaf, a pinnately compound leaf, this one, we don't need to know about this, but even those, even little leaflets can be divided again. So it's called bipinnately. Here's palmate. And this you might be uh, familiar with like clover or something that's called trifoliate. And you don't need to know the rest. Okay, so here is a variety of leaves. So this would be palmately compound. But can we tell without the stem there? They can't really tell because we don't have the stem there to see that axillary bud. But I can tell you that this one is palmately compound, pinnately compound, simple, simple. Palmately, it's a simple leaf, but palmately veined. Here's a simple leaf that is pinnately veined. Here's a pinnately compound. I don't want this to get too confusing, but if you look at this and look back at the description of each, it would be helpful to be able to identify these. Specialized leaves. Well, watermelons and uh, things in that family, the, the, the cucurbits, will often uh, modify, they have modified leaves that are uh, modified into tendrils that claw, they actually cling on to a support. And if you'll notice, the tendrils are always next to where a fruit's going to be because that's going to be the heaviest part of the plant to be supported. Onion <coughs> is an interesting uh, modified leaf. Now, onion has two different modifications. It has a modified stem. This little tiny part there at the very bottom is a modified stem. But these are uh, the, the, the scales, we call them, of an onion are actually modified leaves, modified for storage. Now, this is probably the, everybody's favorite part, the flowers, right? Now, we don't usually grow 
uh, flowers in our vegetable gardens for beauty, although some people do interplant flowers just for that purpose. But here's an eggplant flower and a tomato flower. And you notice we got our purple and gold. Flower function. What does a flower do? Well, for the plant, in the case of the plant, uh, it houses the sexual plant parts, okay? In many species, it attracts pollinators with showy flowers, or it might have nectar down in this flower that the uh, pollinators will seek out. In classification, remember back looking at uh, the scientific names and how plants are related to one another, it can reveal relationships because if you plant the same plant in different locations, especially altitudes, it may, the, the leaves and stems may look quite different, but the flowers will look the same. So here's a, just to show you what a pea plant and a wisteria, they're both in the pea family and they have very, very similar flowers, so they are quite different plants. Parts of a flower, okay? Well, as we start at the bottom, there's usually these little green leaf-like structures called sepals, they kind of subtend the flower just below the petals. Then you have the petals, which are usually more obvious, and then just inside the petals you have the stamens. Now these, now we're getting serious here with sexual reproduction because these are the male uh, sexual reproductive parts, okay? And they have a little stalk, right, that's called a filament, and then they have the, the pollen packet right here, which is called the anther. So a number of those around the pistil. Now this pistil is the female reproductive part. It's the top part is the sticky stigma that receives pollen, and then the pollen tube will grow down. And the, down here is the, oh, this is the style, the stalk. Down here is the ovary, and it's actually where the new little baby plant will be formed. Because this is called an ovule, and inside the ovule are actually egg cells. Inside the pollen that will be formed are actually sperm cells. Now this it will become important when we talk about fruits. This is a receptacle. It's really not one of the technical flower parts, but it's kind of where the flower sits on. Okay, sepals and petals. Okay, again, just under the flowers, most times small green structures, sometimes not obvious at all. Uh, if you put them all together, they have a name called a calyx. Okay, petals again are the brightly colored part of the flower. Okay, they have sometimes fragrance, and sometimes we grow them for that uh, purpose, are uh, nectar to attract pollinators. And if you put them all together, they call the corolla. The stamens, okay, these again are the male reproductive parts. The stalk is the filament, these are the anthers. And these anthers have opened up and you can actually see the pollen grains on them. And then there is the pistil, okay. Again, the stigma, which pollen lands on, and the style. This is the ovary, and in this case there are six ovules in there that each will eventually become a seed. The pistil has three main parts. Again, the stigma, the style, and the ovary. When the pollen gets caught here, it's, it, it's, it has an opportunity to grow down and fertilize the eggs. The style just holds the pistil up in the flower so that it's available to be pollinated. And the ovary contains the ovules, which will contain the egg cells, which will be fertilized and eventually become the new uh, young plant for the next year in this, inside the seed. Pollination and fertilization. Pollination is when the stigma receives pollen. When a bee lands on it and transfers pollen on there, or when the wind blows and transfers pollen right on the stigma, that's pollination. The flower has been pollinated. Nothing else, if nothing else happens, that's all that, nothing will, flower will not produce fruit. Nothing will happen if pollination is all that, that occurs. Um, fertilization is what we're looking for. Okay, that pollen has something to do. Okay. After pollination, the pollen grows a tube. Okay, here is the pollen landing on the stigma. This pollen will grow a tube all the way down the, st the, stig the style into the ovary, and each pollen grain will have to do this and fertilize each one of these ovules. The sperm uh, cells fertilize the egg cells and the ovary, and this results in a zygote, a new plant for the next generation. Here's fruit formation. Once the pollen has uh, made its tube down and fertilized the flower, we'll see how the flowers, how it happens inside this ovary. This ovary with its uh, ovules inside begins to develop. The flower petals will sort of fade away. 
this ovary will begin to swell and eventually become the fruit. The ovule will become the seed. Okay, so as the fruit develops, you may become fleshy, it may become hard, depends on what kind of plant it is, but it will develop after pollination and fertilization until we have a ripe fruit. So if you don't get flowers, you don't get fruit. If you don't get pollination and fertilization of those flowers, you don't get fruit. Okay, there's a, um, a situation in some plants where flowers, okay, here is a, this really a little, <laughs> uh, a little diagram of a flower with its pistil, the female part, and the male parts, got the pistil and the stamens, okay? In some plants, they may not have all, both. They may have only the pistil, or they may have, the flowers may only have the stamens. So these are called pistillate flowers, and these are called staminate flowers. Now, our big example of this in the garden is the squashes, okay? Squashes and uh, melons. They have both, luckily, they have both on the same plant. Okay, so we're, we're, we're in good shape. But what if you have a plant that only makes male flowers or only makes female flowers? Only makes staminate male flowers or pistillate female flowers? Well, then if you want to get pollination, fertilization, and fruit, you need to have, make sure you have plenty of both planted. When we lived in New Jersey, I had a holly tree, and I was so excited that at Christmas I was gonna have nice and red berries to make wreaths from, but it turns out I had the male pollen tree. And it made these cute little teeny yellow flowers that smelled really good and made lots of pollen. But every other tree that was female in my neighborhood was pollinated by my tree, and they got all the berries. Okay, so these are called perfect flowers. When they have both male and female, it's called perfect. Again, in botany, everything has a name. In science, everything has a name, right? So if they don't have both, if they only have female or male for, uh, sexual reproduction parts, they're called imperfect, missing either male or female parts. Example, squash, melons, and corn. Imperfect flowers, these, this is what these are called. If they're, if they're pistil or staminate, staminate, they're called imperfect. Uh, it can present a problem with pollination. Here is the male uh, flower of squash, which I happen to have here to show you. Here is a male flower of squash. And if you open this up, you'll see that there's only the pollen producing part, the stamen. It has quite a stocky little stigma and then there's lots of pollen right there on the stigma. The female part, which is on the same plant, but on a slightly different spot, has, it already looks like there's a little squash here. I have another one that's even younger. This flower is not even open yet, but look, you can already see, because that's because the ovary in this particular plant is way down into the, into the, pet, the, the, the part that holds the flower. Okay, but if you look in here, you'll see the stigma, which is divided up into many little pieces in this particular plant, and I think it has some little snails on it. So you don't, if you grow these, they, they automatically produce both kinds of flowers, so you don't really need uh, to worry about it. But if they're on separate plants, then you need to think about how to manage uh, that. Parthenocarpy, some plants can develop a fruit without having to be pollinated or fertilized, okay? Parthenocarpy. Uh, I have an example of a parthenocarpic cucumber here. This will grow a cucumber even without having uh, pollination in the flowers. The fruit, will, the ovary will still develop. But remember, all fruit comes from the flower. It's technically, if it's a fruit, it comes from the flower. Bananas and some varieties of cucumbers and squash are parthenocarpic. Okay, if you, and the corn is a really odd, an odd plant, okay? Each one of these kernels developed from a pistil. So how many pistils must there have been on this cob? It's a bunch of flowers together. And this is just developed, the little kernel developed from the ovary so that each one of these is a little fruit from the ovary. And guess what the silks are? They're the stigma and style. Each one, of, each one of these little kernels or these little ovaries had a silk that came out 
got pollinated, the pollen tube grew all the way down to the kernel and fertilized the ovules so that the kernel would develop. Now, corn is, is one of those flowers where, I have a corn plant here to show you. This, is the, this was, or they're kind of dried out now, this was the male flower where pollen is produced. Down here would be the female where the corn cob would be, would be with uh, all the little pistils inside. So corn is wind pollinated, right? So if you plant all your corn in a row and the wind doesn't blow that way, it blows this way, what's going to happen? They're not going to get pollinated. And that can cause kernels, you know, get pollinated, don't get fertilized. So you have some kernels that don't quite make it because they never, uh, the sexual reproduction just didn't happen for them. Just again, it's interesting that each corn silk is the stigma and style and that the pollen tube has to grow all the way down that silk to get to the uh, ovary there to fertilize it. Okay, what is a fruit and what is a vegetable? There's a lot of controversy, especially about tomatoes, okay? Well, in the grocery store, a fruit is produce that can, is generally sweet and it can be eaten with little or no preparation. A vegetable is somewhat similar, except it's not very sweet, generally, and it still can be eaten with little or no preparation. That's in the grocery store. But scientifically, in botany, a fruit is a ripened ovary of a flower. A ovary has been pollinated, the flower's been pollinated, the ovary has developed after fertilization, <clears throat> and that's what a fruit is. A vegetable does not occur in science. The word vegetable does not occur in science. Okay, we're going to look at some uh, flowers and what happens to, to them and, their, and how their fruits develop in a little bit. Again, fruit types. Again, in science, everything has a name, and you don't have to learn them all, but here are some that we thought were you important, okay? And fruits are different ways to classify them, okay? We're going to present, and there's many different ways to look at them. We're just going to present uh, what we think is most useful, and this is based on the part or parts of the flower which are involved in making a fruit. Simple fruits, fruits from a single ovary of a single flower. So you have your flower, you have one pistil, one ovary, and the, after pollination and fertilization, the, the fruit grows from that. Simple fruits are things like peppers, eggplants, tomatoes, even small tomatoes, and squash. An aggregate fruit is when one flower has many little pistils in it and they each develop into a small fruit in a group. The example I have here and is up there is uh, a blackberry. This, this, each, each blackberry came from a single flower but it had many pistils and each pistil developed into each one of these little uh, fruits that are in a, it, they're aggregated, right? <laughs> And the raspberry is also very, very similar. The third one that really, you really won't, probably won't be growing these in your garden. I don't know where you live. You might be, okay? If we have any people from Hawaii here or California, multiple fruits. And these are fruits from a, a stem like this with flowers coming off of it, right? That all, and when the ovaries begin to develop, they fuse and they fuse and make one big fruit. Here is actually pineapple flower in flower. This is a stem of flowers, and each of these gets pollinated, fertilized, and the ovaries begin to develop, and as they develop, they fuse in together and become what we call a pineapple fruit. So this is called a multiple fruit because it's ovaries from multiple flowers that have fused. There are accessory fruits. There are fruits that we call them fruits, but it's more than just the ripened ovary. Other parts of the flower or near the flower get involved. Okay, fruits that develop from ovary and other flower parts, accessory fruits. Here is a strawberry. And the strawberry flower looks like this. Here's the kind of the, the, the hypanthium that everything sits on, but all these little pistils are lined up all around it. Each one of these gets fertilized, grows into a little tiny little fruit that we call these little, we call them seeds, but they're actually the little fruits. And the hypanthium grows into this big, red, juicy structure that we eat. So really, a strawberry is a whole group of fruits. 
And each one of these is a little thing, almost like a little sunflower seed. A, a fig, a fig like this, our figs that we grow here in southern Louisiana, are uh, actually kind of the same sort of situation, except they're, they're inside out. Okay, here is the fig as it's growing, and this, uh, the part of the stem that, it, that holds the flower actually grows all around, and all the little pistils are lined up on the inside, and each one of these gets pollinated and fertilized. This all develops into what we call the fig fruit, but it's actually, again, a whole uh, group of little fruits together that we, when we eat a fig, we call it the seed. Okay, it has, some of these are male flowers and some of these are, male, are female flowers, but they're all there together. Now, in figs, how are they pollinated? Well, there's wasps that actually come in this opening here and actually pollinate these so that the fruit begins to develop. I just wanted to show you, we have edible parts here. Uh, I told you in the beginning that there were Roots, stems, and leaves, flowers, fruits, and seeds, right? Well, we have edible roots, right? We have edible stems, the opuntia here. We have edible leaves. We have the kale and the parsley. We have edible flowers. You've ever fried zucchini flowers. We have edible fruits. And we have the sunflower here, which has produced for us some edible seeds. I hope this has been educational in some respect uh, for you. And just remember that uh, when you go to take your little pretest or your test, that you can go back and watch these, uh, this as many times as you need to, to get the information, to get it down where it needs to go so you can remember it. It's been a joy. Thank you.